Chapter 18. A Recrudescence of Divine Right. End of the Dictatorship. A whole European system crumbled away. The empire sank into a gloom which resembled that of the Roman world as it expired. Again we behold the abyss, as in the days of the barbarians. Only the barbarism of 1815, which must be called by its pet name of the counter-revolution, was not long breathed, soon fell to panting, and halted short. The empire was bewept, let us acknowledge the fact, and bewept by heroic eyes. If glory lies in the sword converted into a scepter, the empire had been glory in person. It had diffused over the earth all the light which tyranny can give, a somber light. We will say more. An obscure light. Compared to the true daylight, it is night. This disappearance of night produces the effect of an eclipse. Louis XVIII. Re-entered Paris. The circling dances of the 8th of July effaced the enthusiasms of the 20th of March. The Corsican became the antithesis of the Bernese. The flag on the dome of the Tuileries was white. The exile reigned. Hartwell's pine table took its place in front of the fleur de lis strewn throne of Louis XIV. Bouvines and Fontenoy were mentioned as though they had taken place on the preceding day, Austerlitz having become antiquated. The altar and the throne fraternized majestically. One of the most undisputed forms of the health of society in the 19th century was established over France, and over the continent. Europe adopted the white cockade. Trestithlon was celebrated. The device non pluribus impar reappeared on the stone rays representing a sun upon the front of the barracks on the Quai d'Orsay. Where there had been an imperial guard, there was now a red house. The Arc du Carousel. All laden with badly borne victories. Thrown out of its element among these novelties, a little ashamed, it may be, of Marengo and Arcola, extricated itself from its predicament with the statue of the Duke d'Angoulême. The cemetery of the Madeleine, a terrible pauper's grave in 1793, was covered with jasper and marble, since the bones of Louis XVI. And Marie Antoinette lay in that dust. In the moat of Vincennes a sepulchral shaft sprang from the earth, recalling the fact that the Duke d'Enguin had perished in the very month when Napoleon was crowned. Pope Pius VII, who had performed the coronation very near this death, tranquilly bestowed his blessing on the fall as he had bestowed it on the elevation. At Schoenbrunn there was a little shadow, aged four, whom it was seditious to call the King of Rome. And these things took place and the kings resumed their thrones. And the master of Europe was put in a cage. And the old regime became the new regime. And all the shadows and all the light of the earth changed place, because, on the afternoon of a certain summer's day, a shepherd said to a Prussian in the forest, Go this way, and not that. Quote this 1815 was a sort of lugubrious April. Ancient unhealthy and poisonous realities were covered with new appearances. A lie wedded 1789. The right divine was masked under a charter. Fictions became constitutional. Prejudices, superstitions and mental reservations, with Article 14 in the heart, were varnished over with liberalism. It was the serpent's change of skin. Man had been rendered both greater and smaller by Napoleon. Under this reign of splendid matter, the ideal had received the strange name of ideology. It is a grave imprudence in a great man to turn the future into derision. The populace, however, that food for cannon which is so fond of the cannoneer, sought him with its glance. Where is he? What is he doing? Napoleon is dead said a passer-by to a veteran of Marengo and Waterloo. He dead, cried the soldier. You don't know him. Imagination distrusted this man, even when overthrown.
The depths of Europe were full of darkness after Waterloo. Something enormous remained long empty through Napoleon's disappearance. The kings placed themselves in this void. Ancient Europe profited by it to undertake reforms. There was a holy alliance. Belle alliance, beautiful alliance, the fatal field of Waterloo had said in advance. In presence and in face of that antique Europe reconstructed, the features of a new France were sketched out. The future, which the emperor had rallied, made its entry. On its brow it bore the star, liberty. The glowing eyes of all young generations were turned on it. Singular fact. People were, at one and the same time, in love with the future, liberty, and the past, Napoleon. Defeat had rendered the vanquished greater. Bonaparte fallen seemed more lofty than Napoleon erect. Those who had triumphed were alarmed. England had him guarded by Hudson Lowe, and France had him watched by Montchenu. His folded arms became a source of uneasiness to thrones. Alexander called him, my sleeplessness. This terror was the result of the quantity of revolution which was contained in him. That is what explains and excuses Bonapartist liberalism. This phantom caused the old world to tremble. The kings reigned, but ill at their ease, with the rock of St. Helena on the horizon. While Napoleon was passing through the death struggle at Longwood, the 60,000 men who had fallen on the field of Waterloo were quietly rotting, and something of their peace was shed abroad over the world. The Congress of Vienna made the treaties in 1815, and Europe called this the Restoration. This is what Waterloo was. But what matters it to the infinite? All that tempest, all that cloud, that war, then that peace. All that darkness did not trouble for a moment the light of that immense eye before which a grub skipping from one blade of grass to another equals the eagle soaring from belfry to belfry on the towers of Notre Dame.